And here I am again this afternoon uh, recording a pr presentation that we did just before the pandemic shut us all down in 2019 concerning handwriting, which is the key to unlocking the treasures that are sealed up in records until we can decrypt, decipher them, and get that information into our uh, written histories and our online family trees. When I began working on my family history, I really didn't think twice about whether or not I could decode the records that were placed in front of me. I had been reading handwritten materials and writing by hand since childhood. I knew basic letter forms, and I could usually figure out what I was looking at with a little time, a little concentration. I never imagined that there would be a need to teach a class on historical handwriting styles or to learn more myself. But when I finally began to do a lot of research in the 16th century and 17th century English records, maybe five years ago, I began to see the problem. I stuttered along with great difficulty at first. It was almost like tackling a different language. Uh, until I became familiar with the various conventions of writing in use at that time. Even then, the poor quality of the original pages and the images made from them could be a great challenge. And even worse was my first exposure to German handwriting from church and private records in my own family. The lowercase letters were the same, mostly but some were formed very differently. And the uppercase, well, just forget about it. Transcription was almost as difficult as translation. Modern record keeping techniques and online retrieval systems have gradually deprived us of some very important skills. They've also created unrealistic expectations about the level of effort that we will need to expend in reading the clues of, that our ancestors have left behind. You might be surprised to learn that the first successful commercial typewriter was invented by a team of four men in Milwaukee, Wisconsin in 1878. But that technology did not become particularly widespread in offices, including, including government offices, until the 1890s and the first decade of the 20th century. And then, only in very rare circumstances were older records transcribed into typeface. And of course, thank goodness they weren't, because there were been all kinds of mistakes involved. It was many decades later that individuals began using typewriters at home for personal correspondence. And actually, for most people, handwritten private communication remained very important until the PC became commonplace in the late 1980s and early 1990s. Keyboard communication has not only sent postal revenue into a death spiral and threatened the very existence of the secretarial profession, it's also condemned many of us to absolute ignorance when it comes to decoding handwritten script. Some of us have never been introduced to handwriting in the first place due to changing educational standards. Many others have lost any facility that we had over time due to a lack of practice. But it is time to reclaim what we've lost. Now, this loss may not seem like such a grave deficit until you begin trying to delve into the past, whether for genealogical or historical purposes. In fact, the vast majority of our history has been recorded on perishable materials using very primitive technology. The information was set down by individual scribes working with a handheld writing instrument, either dip pens with metal nibs from the 1830s forwards or quills before that, and then ink and paper on, or parchment. The quality of the media has varied with time and place, as has the facility of each writer in producing a clear, legible hand. Now, the educational ideal at any one time, at least for professionals, but also in standard set for school curricula, was to make penmanship as uniform as possible 
uh, to an established standard so that anybody could communicate with anybody else through handwriting. But each era did have its own fashion when it came to a preferred handwriting style. Sometimes even individual offices of government or professions employed a writing style all their own. Different languages have used their unique orthography and alphabets. Um, but in spite of the efforts at encouraging uniformity, at no time in any given tradition was individual idiosyncrasy not a factor, as we each have our way of holding our pen and forming our letters. And that's just our way as human beings, especially in the Western world, to follow our own muse and form our letters the way we please. Time and fatigue also played their part in degrading handwriting and promoting shortcuts. It's hard for us now to think back to just how taxing it would be on the hands and the eyes to be a professional clerk or scrivener. In addition, just imagine the inadequate level of lighting and all the other competing distractions and tasks that had to be dealt with when there were few labor-saving devices. People did the best they could with the amount of time and the level of education that they had. It's up to us to tease out the information because we have far better conditions under which to conduct our research than they did in producing the sources that we are studying. So why do we even need the ability to read the handwriting in the first place? As genealogists, particularly, we have websites where key details have been extracted and indexed for us using electronic means. We have tons of books of abstracts and transcriptions with indexes to help us. We can probably compile a relatively good genealogy using mediated sources only, that is, sources created from the original by someone who supposedly knows what they are doing. But why move beyond the index entry, the abstract, or the transcription to the original document? Well, first of all, most records have never been transcribed, abstracted, or indexed. What if you find a cache of personal letters written to an ancestor 150 years ago? Will you just skip them if you cannot read them easily? Think of all the personal details that are not captured in public records that could be available to you by simply reading them. No one else will likely have touched them because only a relatively small set of people would benefit from them. Or maybe an item that might help you is part of a set of public records that no one has tapped for publication yet. I can tell you, working through a large volume of public records for a book is a very time-consuming affair, and far more remains unpublished than published. Very few people have either the chops or the patience to do it. And what about that obscure court paper that explains how your ancestor stole a hog and left a severed head in his father-in-law's manger? That record has probably never been transcribed, but the details could prove not only the relationship between the son-in-law and the father-in-law, but something about the character of your ancestor. And I'm taking that from a personal example. Secondly, just dealing with someone else's indexing can leave you very much in the dark, just because so many errors are likely to be made. All the time, I deal with folks who don't want to look at the image of a census page because they feel the indexing form lays it all out for them. Plus, it's just too hard to make out that old scrawl, so they don't even try. But even accurate indexing skips over many details that could be gained from looking at the original. Furthermore, much that is indexed, transcribed, or abstracted is in error. So to give you a good example of that, here is the will of my ancestor, Owen Thomas. He left us in Orange County in 1770 and the will mentions his daughter Anne and gives her married name. Now on the left is Ruth Herndon Shields' abstract of this will, and if I had relied on that, it was the first source I ever saw relative to this document, I would have ignored this will entirely because it calls her Anne Wilkes. 
but the original will clearly describes her as Anne Wicks. You can see that at the lower left-hand corner on the right. And her husband, Joseph Wicks, was a near neighbor of Owen Thomas. This line would remain a dead end for me had I not looked past the abstract to the original and deciphered the script. Now, I am able to trace the Thomases back at this point through Philadelphia County and Chester County, Pennsylvania, to Pembrokeshire and Carmarthenshire in mid-17th century Wales. Another little detail on that matter, what enabled me to get back so far was partly my ability to look at the original Quaker records in the very earliest decades of Pembrokeshire Friends Meeting. Now, those records have been digitized on Ancestry, and supposedly they have also been indexed. But searching the index yielded only one or two references to my Thomas and Howell ancestors there. Now, I simply couldn't believe that they were not mentioned more times than that. But by searching the original images page to page and reading every entry as best I could, I found the marriage record of my ancestors, James Thomas and his wife Elizabeth Howell, and the birth records of most of their children, all of whom they brought to Pennsylvania with them, and those had not been indexed. I was also able to locate the will of their paternal grandfather, Owen Thomas, on the National Library of Wales website and read it from the original with its mention of James Thomas the immigrant. Now, none of this had been transcribed or indexed more than superficially, just by the name of the deceased person. We are living in a, an age of miracles for genealogy, and we know that a lot of printed documents have been converted and in, made indexed by OCR technology, optical character recognition. That only works for print. Now we're moving into a new era where we're beginning to tackle um, materials written in longhand through something called ICR. And if you have been paying attention of late, you'll know that the 1950 census, which was released just a few months ago, family searches using ICR technology to begin the indexing process there. But they are still having humans go in behind that and check it against the original document and make sure that it's doing it accurately. Now, it may be speeding up the process, but we'll only, I mean, only time will tell whether the actual end product is as accurate as we would like to have. It's still in its infancy. It's not public, uh, publicly available to all of us to, to use on our own computers. That's one consideration, but also never will we have all the documents that we want ICR'd for us or every bit of information within the document ICR'd for us. It's going to focus on names and places and not everything that's in that document. So you're still, even with the ICR, if it becomes, you know, accomplished, proven, tried and true, it's never going to provide you with all the detail you need. You're going to have to read some of that document yourself. And there are never enough qualified indexers and transcribers to do the work for us. Most of them are amateurs and volunteers. Some, are, some have questionable levels of skill. And even the very best make mistakes. Even I make a lot of mistakes, I know. So we must learn to do this for ourselves. The rewards, as I think I've shown, are well worth the effort. Now, it might be helpful to pause and consider the circumstances under which old documents were often written. Remember that most were executed with a dip pen of some sort, either a quill, a perhaps from a turkey, a goose, or a swan, whose nib had been sharpened and formed with a pen knife, or, after the 1830s, a metal nibbed pen. Sometimes such pens had little reservoirs built into them, but all of them had to be dipped into the ink repeatedly as the writing progressed, usually in iron gall ink. This made writing a very halting process, 
and it can be easy to lose your place or make dots or splotches on the paper in odd places. Single words could be parted at points where a pause was made. Ink could vary in its ability to adhere to the paper. It could be applied in some places uh, lightly, in others darkly, depending on the level of pressure. When the ink was especially thick, it could bleed through to the other side, making it difficult to tell one side's writing from the other, especially when dealing with a facsimile or a digitized image. Pages needed to be blotted or sanded regularly to dry up excess ink, but this was not always done properly. And also there were time periods when ink was hard to come by, like during the American Civil War in the Confederate South. You notice, in, especially late of the, during the war, um, you'll find a lot of poorly uh, preserved documents because the ink is so light. It wasn't high standard, high quality ink. Also, let's consider a bit the education that our scribes brought with them to the process. Before the advent of public education in America, most individuals were taught the rudiments by tutors, by a parent, by a schoolmaster, uh, retained by community sub subscription. Not, the schools weren't paid for by, by, the, uh, uh, by the government, but by a group of individuals, or perhaps by a minister who doubled as a schoolmaster. And some were educated by writing masters who specifically advertised their ability to teach children the rudiments of writing and traveled around the country. All students learned how to form their letters by imitating from horn books or copy books or from specimens provided from an instructor's own hand. A large proportion of the population was functionally illiterate, even if they could write their own names. Even among the marginally literate, there were far more people who could read a little than who could write to any significant extent. Public record keepers tended to be the better educated individuals in their communities, but even they could be very poorly equipped or very hasty in executing pages. Sometimes they skipped words or phrases due to carelessness or fatigue. Sometimes their handwriting could be very degraded as they wearied. We must also remember that they spent a lot of their time trying to copy from other people's handwriting. And like us, they often struggled with the original text. For example, in a road docket in Guilford County in the 1830s, I found a passage that made me laugh where the clerk basically just gave up. Some of the names he rendered are completely unlike any that are known to exist locally. He was obviously completely out of sync with the original and flailing about. The last name he just gave up on entirely and wrote, somebody cannot read the man's name. Most scribes are not as frank as that when they're confused in their copying. And in this case, the man soon lost his position because the handwriting changes again very soon after that. Be mindful that standards of literacy in the past were very different from those that we're comfortable with today. In our world, shaped by free public education, there's been an attempt to standardize everything. We have been taught to belabor points of grammar, syntax, and punctuation, and to spell words in a regular fashion. We tend to judge those who do not know the arcana of our written language, if just on a subconscious level, as lacking in attainment and socially inferior. But none of that applies before the late 19th century. You should expect to find a general lack of punctuation. Periods are more common than anything else, but even they are sometimes lacking. Other punctuation is more conspicuous by its absence. You may see an occasional colon used instead of a period to make an abbreviation. It goes without saying that spelling tends to be very idiosyncratic. There, was no, there were no dictionaries in America before 1806. Noah Webster's foray was the first attempt to regularize spelling of American English. A lot of individuals just spelled words as they pronounced them. We call that phonetic spelling. A final E could be added to practically any word ending in a consonant. SC could be used for S or C sounds when it when that C makes a s sound. Um, CON 
could be, or C-I-O-N could be used instead of T-I-O-N in words like mention. And a C-K could be used for a simple K, a word that we would use a K for now. Um, any consonant in the middle of a word could be doubled, or a double consonant could appear as a single. Y and IE at the end of words could be interchangeable. Y might replace I as a vowel or vice versa. OU might replace O. I and J were virtually the same letter. Uh, if you go back far enough, particularly at the beginning of proper names. In fact, in some indexes, you'll see that there's only one section for letters or words that begin with I and J. They're all lumped together. Any word could be capitalized, and any proper noun might appear in lower case. People in general tended to capitalize for emphasis, not necessarily to begin sentences or to de designate specific people or places or corporate entities, that is, proper names. Can you imagine how time consuming it was to render pages of writing? with a dip pen in poor light, and particularly if you were a public record keeper, to do that with enough dispatch to meet your deadlines. Imagine a lot of the work being done at home late at night, with or without distraction, and keep in mind how costly loose paper could be, and even more so, bound volumes. Imagine the strain to the hand, to the eye. It was only natural to try to conserve paper, effort, and time by introducing shortcuts. Now these mostly took the form of contractions, abbreviations, and truncations of words, where they simply stop in the middle. You'll see a lot of these, and in fact, I provided a list of common ones in the handout that I can give you if you write to me at the email address at the beginning of this presentation. But remember that almost any word could be abbreviated, and sometimes in a very personal way, uh, idiosyncratic way that requires some thought to decipher. These abbreviated words were often indicated with a period at the end, like we do, sometimes with an apostrophe between the beginning and the end of the word where they omitted something in the middle, sometimes with a small superscripted letter or set of letters at the end uh, between the, uh, the uh, baseline first part of the word and the superscripted last part of the word, and sometimes the scribe would show that he left something out by drawing a line above or through the latter part of the word. And that's sometimes difficult for people. They think it's part of a letter, but it's really just an indication that there is an abbreviation that's been made. The example I put here on the upper right-hand side of this slide is testament, abbreviated T-E-S-T-M-T, -E and a line drawn over the top of it which stands for or suggests that it is an abbreviation for a longer word. We see ADM apostrophe R for administrator a lot, EX apostrophe Y for excellency, as in your excellency, uh, EX apostrophe X for executrix, YEO um, with an, a colon after it for yeoman, a type of farmer, SVT with a line over the top could be for servant. Also, remember that most given names will be abbreviated at some point, especially male given names. It's important to know what these stand for because you will see them all the time. And some of them are pretty close to one another and hard to distinguish. GEO period, short for George. THOS, short for Thomas. JAS, short for James. JOS, short for Joseph. J-O-S apostrophe H, short for Josiah, J-O-S apostrophe A, short for Joshua, J-N-O is associated with the, word, the name John, and J-O-N period for Jonathan, Charles, C-H-A-S, and it goes on and on. Oddly, these are less commonly used for female than male. I don't know why that is, but just probably because male names appear so much more frequently in in records than female names. One of the most common symbols that you will see or special characters 
is the ampersand, of course, standing for the word and. And it tends to proliferate because that's a, such a commonly used word in written text throughout the period that we're discussing. These ampersands take a lot of different forms. They don't all look like your character on your keyboard. Uh, in general, if you see a peculiar squiggle standing alone where an, an and ought to be, it's almost certainly an ampersand. Sometimes they can be almost as small as to escape your notice. And you see the variety of, amp of ampersands that could possibly be up in the top, top left-hand corner of this slide. Related to the ampersand is the ETC, or etc. Usually written ampersand C, because et is the Latin word for and. But there are other special letters that stand for sounds and prevent ha uh, having to render the entire word letter by letter. The most common of these, one that people struggle with very often, is the thorn. That is a character in English that goes back to a rune used in Anglo-Saxon times. But it stands, it usually was, it originally was a letter all its own, and it stands for um, uh, an old uh, digraph TH, the, the sound of th. It looks like a backwards Y, uh, and it's often rendered as a Y, but it's not pronounced like a Y, and probably it should not be rendered as a Y when you're transcribing it. Uh, if it is to be rendered authentically, it should have its own special symbol on our keyboard, somewhat different than Y, or you could just render it THE. Uh, it's typically used with the and that. Likewise, the uppercase X might stand for Christ. So it could be used in words like Christmas, Xmas, or Christopher as a name could be rendered X S T O F or P H E R, or Christian, X I A N. And there are two forms of the letter P as well that can stand in one iteration for per or pre as in perfect. Uh, Presence, uh, rendered as that special P with S-E-N-T-S after it. Prefer, the special P rendered with F-E-R after it. And in other situations, it can stand for pro, and it's made in a slightly different way with the tail going in the opposite direction. And you might see that in words like prescribe, which could be written that special P with S-C-R-I-B-E after it, or provide as P, special P, with V-I-D-E after it. Because there was a desire to conserve paper, as we've already mentioned, you should be prepared to see insertions between lines and in the margins of text that can be very tiny and very difficult to read. This is also be becoming a problem when pre-printed forms come into existence in the early 19th century. The spaces available on the forms were sometimes inconvenient to accommodate all the information that had to be added, so writing could become very small and cramped. Uh, particularly annoying if, if all the names of your ancestors' heirs are crammed in there. You can see paper being reused on the reverse or in the margins, particularly during wartime shortages. A lot of the paper stolen out of courthouses during the Civil War was not due to Yankee depredations in the South, but due to a lack of writing materials for soldiers' correspondence back home. I've seen letters in my family that were written from coastal North Carolina uh, on paper ripped out of courthouse books from eastern North Carolina. It's always helpful to look back at the contemporaneous copybooks or alphabets, or to modern handwriting guides with their antique templates to familiarize yourself with the way letters have been formed in the past. Oftentimes, the forms used are quite different from what we're used to, and sometimes a letter may appear differently depending on whether it begins, ends, or falls in the middle of a word. This is particularly true of the letter S. Flourishes were common at the beginning or the end of letters. 
particularly at the beginning or the ending of words. These tend to extend outward, down toward the next line, or up toward the previous one. And they can be very distracting and misleading and be confused for parts of other letters on other lines. One good technique is to focus on what lies near the baseline in trying to decipher the letter and just ignore what is high above and low be far below it. Um, sometimes in older script, little lines or squiggles were placed at the end of various lines of text when there was a bit of room left over, but not enough to begin the next word. That's meaningless. It's not a dash. It is not part of a letter. It is just a way to line out the rest of that space so that something can't be inserted later, particularly in a legal document. It's the same thing that you do if you're writing a check and you write out the amount and then you draw a line toward the end because you don't want anyone else to change the amount for you. Words carried over between lines are sometimes haphazardly joined by a hyphen or not. The joining symbol may look like an equal sign, uh, more like that than a, a hyphen. And it may as easily appear at the beginning of the second line as at the end of the first. It was common practice in earlier writing to repeat the last words on one page at the beginning of the next. It's not a mistake. It's to ease your continuity in reading if you're interrupted as you change pages. And here to help you are, I'm going to show you a sequence of two uh, templates that show how handwriting was done according to certain standards in the uh, 16th century, uh, 1600s and the 1700s. Um, uh, capital letters, good two versions of the capital letter are on the left and in each column, and two are on the, of the lowercase are on the right. Now, these don't necessarily exhaust all the forms that those letters could take, but here are some of the more common ones. One big pitfall is the double S, in which the first pair of the, uh, the first of the pair, the lead S, extends above and below the baseline, and the second is short, uh, and we the one that we're more used to, the bloops. A so-called double F is sometimes just an antique version of a capital F, as you see here in the first example under F. Um, in general, it's much more difficult to read old capital letters than old lowercase letters. They tend to exhibit far more variations and eccentricities. J and I might be interchangeable. You can see um, how in this particular selection, uh, there's only one set of letters for J and I together. Uh, they don't give us separate lines for J and I because the letters look pretty much the same. The context will help you to figure that out. Likewise, U and V, both upper and lower case, can be extremely similar. And in this case, there's only li one line for U and V, also in this alphabet. Capital C and capital O may appear with a line through the middle of them, or two lines through the middle of them. The C could easily be interpreted as a G, but the capital G has only a partial cross piece, or one running diagonally from the baseline, midway up and to the right. L's and T's can be confused, because folks often forget to cross their T's. Lowercase n and r are easy to confuse, as are oftentimes an old-fashioned lowercase c and r, especially the kind of r that appears at the end of the word. And as you'll remember, I was just telling you that letters might appear differently whether they begin a word, are in the middle of a word, or end a word. A lot of times an old-style r as in the middle of a word will look like a, a cursive r turned upside down like a U with a dip in the middle, but kind of squared off at the bottom. And here's a different kind of an alphabet horn from Hornbook uh, with British, typical British styles from the 1600s. Keep in mind that several letters are composed basically of a series of short upward and downward strokes. 
These strokes are called minims, and these letters tend to get confused with one another, so interchange them in your reading if you find that that will help you break through and decipher what has been written. Minims uh, compose letters like M. You know, there are three minims there. N, two minims. W, three minims from an opposite direction. U, two minims. And B, two minims. And, and I, lowercase i, is one minim. But B and U can be confused. M and W are easy to confuse. Uh, N and U possibly could be easy to confuse if the letters are not fully formed. These are all typical minim dependent letters that tend to get confused with one another. Sometimes a confusing series of letters is, com is a combination of several of these minim characters, some of which you may be combining and trying to decode as a unit. There are also long stroke letters extending above and below the baseline that can be confused easily. Switching back and forth between the options can help. Old-fashioned long S, old-style H, you see how in this case it loops up, comes over a little bit, and then plunges below the line and sweeps back up. You might see that and, and interpret it as a Z, perhaps, or an S, but it is an H. Switch back and forth between the options. Old-fashioned long S and old-style H and F fit into this category. Similarly, letters that only extend below the baseline can be confused, like old style Z or old style P. Q, G, and Y. And I'm giving you time to look at each of those and just compare them to one another on this template and see how they can be very similar to one another. Letters with longer vertical elements and a forward curve near the baseline can be confused. Think about K, for example, and B. Strangely, in 16th century and 17th century scripts, D and E look similar because the loop in the E can appear high above the baseline and to the right. And you can see an example of that here. Toward the end of that line of short lowercase e's, you can see some of what I'm talking about that really looks kind of like a D on the line above. And um, EL could be mistaken for D as well. That's an uppercase E and an L. Be on the lookout for vowel confusion, especially small case A, O, and E. All of those are similar enough that with the right circumstances, the right kind of haste, they could be made in a very awkward and confusing way. K, lower or uppercase, could be mistaken for capital R. And look at that very carefully. A lowercase r is often written upside down when it lies in the middle part of a word, so that, as I said earlier, if you look at, at the examples here, uh, I don't think it shows it on this. Yeah, the very first example of a lowercase r is what I'm talking about there. It's like a, a we would write a modern uh, r, like the third example, if we were doing longhand, uh, but in old former times, that first example of an upside-down version is more commonplace. The number 8 may also appear to lie on its side near the baseline, uh, and that can be confusing to people. Remember to try to segregate lines of lettering from each other and distinguish front-side lettering from bleed-through from the back of the sheet? Now here's a tip. The angles of the letters are usually exactly opposite if it's coming from the other side of the document. So bleed through is usually running in the opposite angle from the text you're working on. Sometimes lines on letters extending up from lower lines
ones or down from upper ones can obscure the letters on the middle line that we're trying to read. And loose dots on the page could be misinterpreted as elements of letters or periods when they're really just drips of ink from a sloppy pen or a point where the pen came to rest as the scribe paused in following the text or as he prepared to replenish his ink from the well. Are there some general approaches that you can use when you're having difficulty reading text? Uh, I'm going to give you a few strategies that you can try when you're really stuck. And I think they work. I've used them many times myself. Many other people can attest to them as well. Skim and select. When you're faced with a difficult bit of writing, start by skimming over the page and picking out words and phrases that seem relatively obvious to you. Usually there are always a few. From these, you can get the overall gist of what is being said and discussed, perhaps. If so, then you might ask yourself what other words and phrases might be expected to appear and see if you can locate those. Or you can use the letter forms that you see in those known words to compare against unknown words and find those letters in those words as well. Transcribe. Take your time and transcribe what you can, leaving blanks where you are uncertain. Do this in pencil or in a word processor so that you can make changes later. Start with just the words that are clear, then go back and fill in intervening letters that are obvious from words you are uncertain about. Before you know it, words will begin to pop out at you, and as more letters forms are revealed, more words will become obvious. Using context. Pay attention to context. Some words will reveal themselves because much of the sentence is already known. And the word obviously must be there among what you can read, or you, what you cannot read. Think of it as sort of like a game of Wheel of Fortune. Use formularies. A lot of documents follow templates or patterns. They have standard boilerplate language. If you've seen enough deeds, or wills, or bonds, you know the stock words and phrases which are typically used. Even personal letters or diaries sometimes follow formulae to some extent. For, ex for instance, there's a typical greeting and closing. In a given era, there might be a typical opening. We are all well at the present time, hoping these few lines may find you in the same condition or something to that effect. Or, I seat myself to drop you a few lines. You may expect to see words reflecting relationship, weather, health, neighborhood news, legal or financial matters, whatever. Look for those formulaic words, phrases, and sentences in your document, and then use the letters in the known passages to decipher unknown words letter by letter. Also, in this process, pay attention to how letters are typically formed, depending on whether they begin a word, lie in the middle, or at the end of a word. And with legal documents, it's even more stark because that language tends to be very typically the same between one, one example of that document, like a will or a deed, and another. Develop an alphabetic key. Old copybook alphabets are very helpful, but each writer tends to have his own idiosyncratic way of rendering letters. There are certain habits that you'll learn as typically individual of the scribe that you're reading. Sometimes when you are having a lot of difficulty, it might just pay to build your own alphabetic guide by tracing or imitating each capital letter and lowercase letter for a given scribe using words you can read, and then employ this as a key for decoding the rest of the document. Remember that there might be several different versions of a letter depending on where it is placed and how it connects to neighboring letters. Imitate. If you come across a particular word that's baffling you, Try to reproduce it yourself. Making the necessary strokes can help you see what the letter is. This can help be even more helpful than taking a passive visual approach. I do this a lot of times when I'm at the archives looking at original documents 
if I cannot decipher a letter, I render it exactly as I can, or even a whole word, and then later on I'll eyeball it, I'll, I'll eyeball it and see what it is um, when I'm out of the situation and I can look at it in a, in a broader context. Enlist another pair of eyes. It often helps to work with somebody else so that you can compare your reading against theirs. You have to be careful, however, not to prejudice their thinking by telling them what you think the thing is before they have a chance to look at it themselves. Digital documents. Scan your document into an alterable format at relatively high resolution. And when I mean when I say alterable, I mean like an image, kind of an image document, a PNG, a TIFF, a, a JPG. Um, otherwise, you, you know you won't be able to edit it. In this case, you want to be able to edit it so you can enhance your ability to, to read it. You might be able to lighten dark areas of the text, increase the contrast, uh, zoom in as much as you need, apply a color filter to help words stand out from a dark background, or reverse it from a positive image to a negative image, white on black. Sometimes it's easier to read white on black than black on white. Your only other alternative is an old-fashioned magnifier, but digital tools are far more versatile. And then we'll move on to techniques for proper names and signatures, which are the most difficult to deal with. Place names and individual names, particularly signatures, can be a real pain. They're far worse than any other part of the document. But these are usually the bits of the document that are most important to us. Who was involved in the event or the obligation the document describes, and where did it occur? Part of this problem comes about through our own ignorance of the lay of the land when it comes to family names and places. Part comes through vanity, haste, and the illiteracy of, subs of subscribers, people who signed the document. If you're not familiar with the geographical area where the document was made or to which it refers, Please consult a map or a gazetteer for the period and look over the area and its features, including towns, creeks, mills, churches, mountains, and hills. The gazetteer will be particularly helpful when places are referred to by more than one name or more than one typical variation in spelling. Gazetteers will often reveal these details. Remember the phonetic spelling rule when it comes to either variety of name, because these Place names are often misspelled from what we would expect them to be uh, according to modern standards. When reading a person's name or signature, it's often easier to read the forename than the surname. Forenames tend to be relatively limited in number, and you're likely to be already familiar with most of them. You can use the letters you've deciphered through the forenames to help you pick apart the surnames. And then you'll want to consult other works on the area, uh, published, rec published documents and records, published histories, um, traveler's guides, folklore companions, or comp compilations, uh, to discover what the typical surnames are for that region. Chances are nearly every name which you will encounter has already been recorded or transcribed and indexed by someone else who has more knowledge than you. Above all, practice. You can listen to me and tone all day about strategy and typical letter forms, but until you start practicing, you will never learn to read these documents with any facility. The good news is, the more experience you get, the more you'll be able to understand unconsciously without having to employ a deliberate strategy. The more practice you get with individual secretaries and clerks, the more you'll be able to skim freely through their handwriting, looking for references to keywords that you're interested in. A lot of research involves skimming through handwritten material looking for evidence. Ideally, you'll want this to become second nature for you. Now let's do one together. We're going to follow through on my advice that you have to practice, practice, practice in order to get any good at this. But the more you do it, the more facility you'll have the more second nature it will all be. And let me say that if you can read this document after working at it for a while, you will be able to tackle 
practically anything. I'm starting you on a very hard one so that you'll see that even this is possible. This is the will of my probable Welsh ancestor, the first Owen Thomas. I referred to him earlier as um, the great great the great grandfather, the grandfather of the immigrant who came to Pennsylvania and whose family was Quaker. It was written in 1758 or 1658 and probated in 1662 in the parish of Landevi Velfray. So that's a key point because it's a public document. We know it's going to follow a certain formula, but not necessarily the same will formulary that we're used to in modern times. Looking at some transcripts of other wills from this time period would help us to decipher it. So what should we expect before we even try to read this will? What will it begin with? What comes next? What comes after that? Well, obviously we'll start with the name of the testator, the location, in this case a parish, the date, references to God and his physical and mental state in these first few lines. I'm going to reveal them for you. Here we go. Here's the first few lines. So it starts as we might expect a will to begin in the name of God, Amen, and in the date, the 20th day of June, in the year, in, yeah, in the year of the Lord God. Now, as you go across that line, just look at some of the unusual things that we're not used to in modern script. For instance, here is that unusual H, or lowercase h, between the initial T and the final E. Now it loops up, goes straight down, and does a curve at the end. That is a typical way of rendering an H at this time period. And then after that is one of those E's that we said could look like a D, particularly common at the end of a word. It's a little loop up toward the top, and then it slips straight out. Name. Okay, this is an N, but it looks like a W. It is an N, clearly, here until this point, and then it flashes up. And that is a flourish. It is not your typical N, even from the formularies of this period of time. The rest of that word looks very similar, except for that last E, which is written sort of like a D, with a little loop at the bottom, flip, and then out. Of, okay, this is an F, typical long F. God, not capitalized, by the way. It's the lowercase g. Amen. And the A is kind of a little divot up. The, and see how much different that H is from the H over here. It's not the old style H. It's more like our modern H. So this guy is kind of mixing and matching his letter forms. 20th. It's pretty easy to see. There's that strange little E there again. The T is pretty much like our common modern capital T. W, all the rest of it looks very close, except for that final H, which is very much like the H over here. Uh, day. Now, the spelling is kind of the problem with this. Although this is a D, and it's clearly a D, and it loops up and down, that's a flourish right there. That is not really... The, an essential part of that letter is just him kind of showing off. He writes an A, an I, and there's a dot for the I, and then that strange little E at the end. See how it's spelled unusually? D-A-I-E, not the way we would spell it, but an archaic form of spelling. But it's still pretty obvious if you can decipher the individual letters what, what the word is. Of June, and here this J looks so much like the I in the next word, in. See the J there? Compare it to the I there. Not a whole lot of difference because as I told you before, J and I are pretty much the same letter at this period of time. And there you have another the, like the the over here. If you got this the, you can certainly get this the. Year, Y, pretty obvious Y, except the little loop is backwards. E-E-R-E. -E -E. Of, there's the long F. And here is our first instance of an, a thorn. It, it 
kind of looks like a Y for the sky, but not a whole lot. It just looks like a little loop and then up. Uh, and uh, there's the E at the end, uh, kind of lifted above. But that is not a Y. It is a thorn standing for the digraph TH that sounds like th. Uh, he could have done it here with this the, but he chose to only do it here. And then there's Lord and God with a lowercase g. So let's go ahead and go on to the second, and I'll give you a few more. Give you a few more pointers. Here we have 1,000. So we're going on to the date. We know this is coming because we started with the date here. It's continuing on this line. Written out. 1,650 and 9. So let's just analyze that a little bit. There's that weird O. I told you C's and O's that are capitalized can have a slash through them. The uh, O slash tending to come up from the lower side on the left and up to the right side. There's that weird E at the end that's kind of up toward the uh, upper end of the line. 1,000. The T and that weird H, like the H here, it's a capitalized T this time. There's a long S in the middle, as we'll often see, either singly in the middle or with another shorter S, if it's a double S. Here's a capital S. This is the way they make their capital S, and it kind of forms an S shape, if you think about it, except exaggerated. Six spelled with an E at the end, S-I-X-E. There is a capital H, so it's formed very much like the lowercase h's we were dealing with over here. 100, 50, spelled F-I-E-F-T-I-E, -E, 50, spelled unusually, and 9. I, Owen, Thomas, O, again, like the capital o over here in 1000. And remember, I's and J's are the same, pretty much. Uh, there's Thomas, and aside from the S, I don't see anything unusual there. Of Landevi, okay, there's a double L, A, with a loop up, N-D-E-W-Y, and Belfre, almost impossible to see Belfre. But they had as much trouble spelling with this word as we do at the time. Uh, it really takes looking at a gas tier to figure out what that letter is, what these, this particular word is or place is. That's why I recommended gazetteers and maps. You know where this guy died, you can look at the parishes around there and figure it out. Let's look at one more line here. And then I'm going to set you free to try to do the rest of it on your own. And I recommend you pause the video uh, for a moment while you work out the rest of it as best you can. Okay, so we've got name, we've got the date, we've got his name. Um, God is referenced, things that we'd expect at the beginning of a will, his place, where he resides, and what do we expect next? Well, we've got a parish, but another part of the place is the county in England, so we should see that next if we're familiar with the way wills are constructed, and that's exactly what comes next. In the, with that H, it's like all the these we've seen before, and here maybe you'd have a lot of difficulty with this because it is an abbreviation, uh, but we can read the next couple things pretty easily. Of and Pembroke. And the interesting thing about print Pembroke, P is pretty obvious. It is a capital P. Uh, there's an E like we've seen, a little loop up, high on the line. M, B, R, that's all easy to see. O. And then we've got something that kind of looks like an R. Very often, you will see lowercase c's in this period of time in the middle of a word that look like uh, we might write a, um, a non-cursive R. Uh, you know, it just, it isn't though. It is a C. It's only like a half-formed C, the way we're looking at it. Then a K and an E. Now, that's not how you spell Pembroke today, right? Pembroke, we would spell it P-E-M-B-R-O-K-E. -E. But C-K and K... Same sound, people often favored using CK instead of just K, or just C. And they like to add an E, and uh, actually that should be there. Go back to this, what is this? Well, this is an abbreviation 
and you wouldn't know what it was unless you consult maybe some references for British research, but it is short for a Latin word that stands for county, comitatus, and that is basically saying in the comitatus of Pembroke or the county of Pembroke. Um, this is G-E-N, short, another abbreviation, short for gentleman. Being with an E on the end, B and the E are pretty easy to see based on what I've already told you. Sick, spelled S, long S. Uh, you begin a, a, a lowercase word with an S. You might make it a, um, you might make it look long like that. I C, just like that C over here that we were looking at before in Pembroke. In the middle of a word, a C often looks like a, a printed R, lowercase R. Sick, S I C K E adds an E to so many words. In body, instead of using a Y at the end of body, he uses IE, like we would expect, probably. But of good and, and here's a, another example of a common use of P's as abbreviations. This is not your standard P. If we were to look for another P in this particular uh, lowercase P, it was, we see it's not formed like this with a backward loop. This backward loop stands for P-E-R. It is a, an abbreviation for that sound of P-E-R. And he ends it with F-E-C-T. So this is perfect. It, um, this letter stands for a sound, not just for a letter P. Uh, and you'll see that also in a slightly different way with the loop going in the other direction for P-R-O, pro, which occurs at the beginning of many words. There's another one of those weird C's that looks kind of like a printed R. Memory, spelled M-E-M-O-R-I-E, -E, again, instead of the Y. Um, laud, as in laud to God, L-A-U-D-E. And let's do one more. And a praise be given unto this is a weird capital A, kind of looks a little bit like the one in Amen, except it's just a little bit weirder looking. Almighty, double L, M I G H, that's that weird looping down T, uh, H rather, and then T I E instead of T Y. God, praise be given unto Almighty God. And willing to settle. Long S beginning that first that that letter that word settle. There's an E on the end of willing. My estate. Uh, long S there, two T's, an A with a, a slash up from it. Sometimes you see that in this document. I think you've seen that before. Lowercase A is formed in a rather odd manner. Uh, that example first I saw that was a day right here at the top line. B A I E. Um, do make and, although that's very difficult to see because it's running off the page. So what I recommend you do, now that I've given you pointers about how to read this document, and you kind of know what's coming next, you can see if you're at all familiar with how wills go, pause it, see if you can finish it, and then we'll go through the last four lines together. And I will pause until I give you time to stop the video. Okay, hopefully you paused and now I can begin again just, and we'll look at the next little few bits of this. I'm just gonna open it all up for you all at one time so we can speed through the rest of this. So we finish through this line. I think. That's where we are, okay. Declare this my last will. And here is our first example of an ampersand. And for him, it's just a little squiggle near the bottom, near the baseline. And 
Testament. Now this is an abbreviation. It's a T E long S T. A with that weird upward part of it coming at the front of it, like the one we saw up here in A. Um, but then it has an M and a T, and that's where it ends. They didn't put all the letters in between the M and the T. N, there's another weird A with that upward slash at the beginning of it. M-A-N-N-E-R, manner, and F-O-R-M-E, form, following, first, and, principally. Now, the first is a capital F. It looks like two lowercase s together, but if you were paying attention earlier on, we talked about how capital Fs in this period can be double F looking. I commend, now you'll notice there looks like there should be a T or something in this. Maybe this ends in a T, that's not right. This is that line that I was telling you about that sometimes scribes use in this period to indicate that they've left something out. And what he left out was one of the M's. My soul, with an E at the end, unto the hands of Almighty, spelled I-E, God, my Maker, ampersand again, and Redeemer, and my body, and that's partly cut off, B-O-D, to be interred in Christian burial. Now, that Christian could be rendered as X-I-A-N, but that's not how he did it. Uh, he spelled it out, and you notice that weird C there, capital C with a slash through it. But it's more straight across than the O, which is kind of from the bottom to the top, from the left to the right. In the C here, capital C, it's straight across. There's the S and the T running together there, a long S and a T, I-A-N, burial in the, and here we have another little um, abbreviation for parish, uh, P, okay, and then I-S-H-E, that's his abbreviation for parish. In the parish church, C, like the C over here with a line through it, all this little smudge, and then H-U-R-C-H, -H, of Landevi del Frey, aforesaid. I think maybe I have one line here. Let's see if I did one more line. Uh, yeah. I give and bequeath towards thee, and here's a very difficult um, abbreviation and misspelling of a word. R-E-P-C-O-U-N. Reparation is what that stands for, for the repair, in other words. And instead of C-I-O-N or T-I-O-N, he used C-O-U-N for that sound at the end of reparation and left out what was in the middle. Of the parish, same abbreviation as we saw above right here, it's also here, Church of Alain Devi Belfray. And here's the word to, spelled T-W-O-E. <laughs> he can appear at the end of any word. So we got through it. How did you do? Well, you'll be happy to know that the next couple examples are not nearly as hard as this one. And now it's time for an exercise that's a little more accessible, dating from the latter part of the 18th century. This handwriting is a whole lot more accessible to us, although there are still uh, little flourishes in here that are a little bit difficult. There are some abbreviations, um, and there's a lot of um, spelling that is uh, irregular to our eyes. There are um, there's uh, errant capitalization in here, um, lowercase and uppercase, really no rhyme or reason. This is the first part of the document. So we'll do a few lines of this together, and then I'm going to move on to the next slide and let you work on it. Normally, I, before revealing the answers, 
normally I would have people break up into groups if you were doing this with me live and work on it together because I think multiple eyes are always better than just one pair of eyes when you're dealing with this stuff, particularly when you're new to it. Um, maybe a lot of you will not be so new to this style of writing as you were to the previous style that we were just looking at. So this is the first part rendered. It's a deed, and we're starting at the top with a description of what the deed is. There's a page number 83 up here, and we're saying, well, what is this deed? What is it about? Well, it's from Daniel Gould. See how that G is formed with a tail. To, capital T-O, T-H-O, period. What's that stand for? That's the first name of somebody. Thomas. Last name is Dockery. This S-E-R here is short for senior. So Thomas Dockery Sr. is receiving this land or this deed or instrument, this gift, whatever it is, from Daniel Gould. Um, and then the second name is Daniel Thomas with D-A-N and superscripted L short for Daniel and others. And that's an ampersand for this person right here, standing for and. So it's a deed from Daniel Gould to Thomas Dockery Sr., Daniel Thomas, and others. It starts out for where we're where we are behind this little bracket here. We are in the state of, instead of writing out north, they wrote in and a superscripted O as an abbreviation for north. So it's the state of North Carolina. That part is easy to read. And the county is below that. You can see C-O-U-N-T-Y easily. The county is Richmond. And the only thing that's kind of confusing there is that flourish of the tail of the D coming back over the rest of the letter. That's not an abbreviation symbol or signif signifier as we saw in the previous document. It's just a weird way, a fancy way of writing the letter um, D. Then the D text begins. Whereas a deed of conveyance was made from John Long to Simon Thomas, William Covington, and Thomas Dockery, dated, capital D, the 12th day of November, 1774, for three acres of land, capital L, on the east side of, now that might be difficult. We know we're going to talk about a creek or a river from this context, and we can see creek pretty easily, but we might need to get out a map to figure out what this word is. And we'd see that there is a creek in Richmond County called Cartledge's Creek. That's what this is, Cartledge's Creek for the and that begins, uh, the, that get, ends the first part of this that I was going to do with you. I'm going to give you time to do the rest of it on the next slide by yourself and then see the answer. Okay, so here is your first exercise. We've done the first few lines. I've cut the, the page in half so that the image is enlarged and you'll be able to read it more easily on your screen. And I'm going to give you time. There's an overlap in the line. The, the last line on the left is the first line on the right. Take your time. Pause the video. See if you can successfully transcribe the document. And then we will examine uh, what's left and give you time to, to compare against what you came up with. All right, well, how did you do? You can compare how I read this against how you read it. Not to say that there, I've made absolutely no mistakes here. I very well might have. Some of the challenges here are flourishes, particularly on capital letters like D, L, and C, and final lowercase d's. The double S, the long and short S, 
is present in this document occasionally. Um, the capital J and the I could be confused sometimes here. There are occasionally um, lines and squiggles meant to finish out a line that has not reached the very end of the page so that nothing can be inserted. Remember that this is a legal document and that was done um, to protect its integrity. There are some proper names here if you're not familiar with the local names in Richmond County. Some of them might be confusing to you. Uh, you might want to consult some de books related to this county to see what the typical surnames were. If you're in confusion about any of them, you've got Gould and Morton and Bostick and uh, Covington, Robinson, uh, Terry, but um, they're not too hard. This was not that challenging, was it? Now we're going to move on to something that may give you a few more difficulties. Okay, this is another document related to my Thomas research in uh, Quaker records, in this case, of Wales. And if I told you earlier, if I had not been able to read the original records of this church, this me meeting rather, in uh, Quaker meeting in, in Carmarthenshire, um, I would not have gotten all the information that I could have because not every name and this not every place in it is indexed or indexed properly and I couldn't find it just searching for it um, so I'll start you out this is a marriage record okay so Quaker marriage record that shows the company of people that were present on a day when my ancestors were married um, on the Howell side actually and we'll start with the first three lines and then I'm gonna stop and let you look at the rest of it. And while you look at the rest of it, uh, you can transcribe as many of the names as you can, as many of the rest of these lines of, of text as you can, and we'll compare against the final, the final answer uh, according to me. Not that I always get it right. Okay, the very first line at the top is beginning with a weird looking capital T which looks a lot like this one. It's the same letter. Easy to read. It's not a thorn. It's just a capital T, and the E is spelled as we would expect. T-H-E. The E, a little bit odd. Maybe you could construe that as a C, but it, it is a little bit different from your typical C that this guy is doing. And as you know, Quakers like to write their days and months in a different way by number rather than giving them names. Tenth day of, and this is a thorn, okay, standing for the dithong th and a superscripted e. The is how this should be rendered. I put ye in square brackets so you just know what that was. Then you have m with a little slash and 12. For this guy, that is an abbreviation meaning the 12th month, 1680. That's real clear. There's a little dash at the end. That's not one of those dashes to try to prevent people from writing because it doesn't go all the way to the end of the page. It's just a dash. Okay, it's a marriage. We know that. So let's see if we can figure out what the form is here. We're going to expect, I guess, a, a date. We're going to expect the uh, name of the groom, the name of the bride, probably where they're living. So that's what we'll probably see first. This day, Francis, there's that double F we've been talking about before as a capital F. It's not two Fs, it's one F, a capital F. Francis, and see how the C is a little bit different than the R, but they're similar in another way. The C uh, does not have a lower sort of curve to it. It just has an upper curve that's at a right angle. Howell, spelled with one L of, and here's a place. Place names are always difficult. This is a parish name, and this parish, you might have to look at a parish map to figure it out, is Lan de Cilio. Okay, and that's a C there, S-C, long S, and that C that kind of looks like an R. N, and here we have another thorn and 
So that stands for T H E V County, pretty clear, of Carmarthen. Carmarthen, sure, you know, you can look at a county map of Wales and easily tell which county we're dealing with. County is a clear, clearly written word. Of is pretty clear. This one, if you're not sure what it was, you just look at a map and it will be very apparent to you. Did, in, there's another the with a thorn. Here's a P and a superscripted R because he left out the letter E. So P-R-S-E-N-C-E, -E, presence. That's a shortened version of presence, just by dropping one letter. You might not think it's worth it, but to this scribe, apparently it is worth it to drop that one letter. Of, in the presence of God, and here is his first instance of an ampersand. That's what that is. And in another thorn E, the, in the, another presence of these, and there's a long S, that weird little E at the end that comes up toward the top of the line of these subscribed, and that's a C that kind of looks like an R in the middle of the word, take. So Francis is going to take somebody. So you can pretty much bet that the next word is the bride's name. So I'm going to halt there, and I want you to take your time and see if you can do the next four lines and the, the list of the, those present for this wedding. The answer is on the next slide, so we'll stop here for a few moments while you do that. Okay, here's that same document to the left. Here's my answer to the right. So compare what you have against what I have. And I suspect some of the like place names, there's another place there, name there for the parish of the bride. You probably didn't get that too easily. Uh, maybe you did, I don't know. It might take looking at a map of parishes in Pembrokeshire to be sure. Uh, what else might have tripped you up here? Well, um, there, we talked about the unusual capital T. Uh, we, we talked about the double F. There are a lot of thorns uh, used for TH. The unusual E at the end that kind of rises toward the top of the line. We have some P's for per and pro in here as a shorthand. We have long S's in the middle of words, even not doubled sometimes. We have the final S that is kind of uh, unusual, kind of curved, um, little loop at the end rather than a full S like this one here. Um, we have upside down R's in this document as well in various places. Um, let's see what else. We have abbreviated words, uh, a few squiggles. We have that C-O-N used for shun like in the word relation right here, and there is a line over that. That is a C, right, by the way, an O-N-S, and this just shows that something has been abbreviated. That is not a T. Um, let's see, we have CKs used for K, like in um, Pembroke here. That's a CK, where we would normally just use a K. And they're in uh, ease. And then we have all these personal names. Now, they're not too hard. Um, Musgrave maybe gave you some problems here. Uh, they're howls. We would expect that because the, the groom is a howl. Harris. I think maybe the hardest one is Sims, Simmons. There's a Simmons there. There's a Simmons there. The Y and the I are interchangeable sometimes just the way they pronounced them, so they didn't care which one they used. Here's a Lewis with the E that's kind of a curve up toward the top of the line, and the final S is just a kind of a loop. Uh, they're very uh, minimal. A Peregrine would be really hard to get unless you're familiar with that name. Um, there's a, a superscripted E there, an R. I think he leaves out the E 
and then G-R-I-N-E, which is really a kind of a upwards loop again. And, oh, here is the abbreviation for Thomas, T-H-O with, as I've told you earlier in this uh, presentation, a colon after it, short for Thomas instead of a period. And at the very edge here, it says with others. So there were others present that he didn't list. So I hope this wasn't too difficult for you. This one was a lot easier than that first example, even though it's from the same century. And I would just suggest that even if you feel a little bit lost now, you've been taken through a whirlwind tour of early handwriting in the English language. German handwriting is a completely different monster. I'm not going to try to tackle that here. We can do that a different time. But what you should keep in mind is, as hard as this may be, there are a lot of little tricks that can get you through it. There's context. There's a type of document and templates. There are letter forms that you can study and compare. There's starting with something you know and, and then using it to decipher what you don't know. There's getting another pair of eyes. There's enhancing the image. All of these can be used. But the best thing you can do is just work. Work at it. Do one example. Do another example. Do another example. Over time, if you're working in the same period over multiple documents, you'll find that it just gets easier and easier, and you're recognizing things without even thinking anymore. You're almost becoming acclimatized to that period of time and its standards for writing, and now you're becoming proficient. You could almost write it yourself. You're so familiar with the letter forms. Don't let it intimidate you. Don't let it overcome you. Just go for it.